Hello and welcome back to Bites of History with Irene Walton. I'm your host, Irene Walton. And today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite drinks of my childhood, Snapple. Have you ever wondered how it made it to your table? Have you ever wondered how it made it to your shelf? If you love food, then this is the show for you. Bites of History with Irene. I don't know about you, but as a child growing up in the 90s, Snapple was like the tea. Well, it was, you know what? And it was the tea. Snapple was the tea of it all. But Snapple actually has a really interesting history. Well, it's it's kind of interesting. <laughs> it's cute and it's sweet and it made me smile. I just thought it'd be fun to share. I loved Snapple so much. I honestly probably still do. I just haven't had one in a long time. Um... But today we're going to be talking about the history of Snapple and the Snapple lady and also the real facts, which is honestly the whole reason I did this episode was because I was like, I've heard some tea about real facts and I need to look into that. And then I found out that the history of it was actually kind of cool. So we're going to start at the beginning and end at the end. And in the middle... We'll do the middle part. I'm going to let you know I'm in a bit of a weird mood. I have had a weird couple of weeks. Everything is okay. Realistically, my nervous system just needs to like chill out for a minute. And that's okay. Sometimes stuff is weird. I've always said that. (laughs) When you think I read, you think sometimes stuff is weird. That's what she always says. I want to thank my sweet, sweet, sweet baby patrons. I love you guys very much. It is a true joy in my life to get to have you. An extra special thank you to, I don't want to say this wrong, so I'm going to look at my phone, Tara Trukovich, who sponsored today's episode. She was kind enough to Venmo me and get my coffee for this research. So thank you so much, Tara or Tara. I'm not sure which one it is. And of course, thank you to my sources. I couldn't do this show without you. So thank you to Snapple.com, HuffPost.com, GreaterLongIsland.com. That article was actually great. A lot of this information I I was able to source from there. TheAtlantic.com, ReadersDigest.com. And I did watch a bunch of old commercials on YouTube, but I didn't get a ton of my Snapple info from there. So that's that. So like I was saying, the history of Snapple is super cute. It's fun. It's interesting. It's not the craziest story we've ever told on this podcast, but I think it's definitely worth talking about, especially for how deeply I loved Snapple. I think I'm going to get a Snapple today. I'm really excited about it. I know I'm going to go to the liquor store before I go to work and pick up a Snapple. I'm really looking forward to my little treat. So the year is 1972, and there are three men, two of which are brothers-in-law. One is just their friend. The two brothers-in-law have a window washing company, and the other guy has a health food store. The guys are... I have the hardest time saying this, so I'm just going to read it off. Leonard Marsh, Hyman Golden, and Aaron Green... Arnold Greenberg. I'm f***ing it up so hard. Leonard Marsh, Hyman Golden, and Arnold Greenberg. They're all buddies, basically, is what I'm saying. And in 1972, um, they were like, we should start a juice company. And they were, after that, were like, does anyone know how to make juice? (laughs) Or anything about juice, literally at all? And they were all like, no. Which I think is so funny. That'd be like if I was like, I think I should be a lighthouse operator. And somebody would be like, oh, do you like know about that stuff? No. One of the men, Marsh, was actually quoted as saying he knew as much about juice as making an atom bomb. So that's that's where they're starting. Could not tell you what motivated them. I think the one who had the health food store may have like seen it like drinks trending in the way of juice. So maybe they wanted to hop on that trend. And what a good trend to hop on. Now, these three men launched their juice company that they know nothing about under the moniker Unadulterated Food Products. Sure. Now, this was pretty much like a side hustle for these guys. This was not their full time thing. They kept their health. um, The one kept their health food store and then the two of them kept their window washing business. But They were still working on it and they were really good at making super fun flavors of fruit juices. So like fun combinations, cool titles, it looked pretty and people were excited about it. Now their first like most popular juice was this carbonated apple juice that everybody loved. This is actually where they got the name that would eventually become Snapple because they it was like their snappy apple juice. It was a portmanteau of those two. So it was Snapple. What made this apple juice so snappy? I'm so happy you asked. They had accidentally fermented the whole batch of it. So what they were actually doing was making like 
alcoholic apple juice wine, pretty much. (laughs) And they didn't notice this until the tops of all of the apple juices started popping off. If you guys have ever, you know, seen kombucha being made or popped a champagne bottle, you know there's so much pressurized CO2 in there that stuff will pop off if it's not covered properly. They thought it was just juice, so they didn't need to tighten it super hard or whatever. So all of these caps start popping off. Golden, one of the founders, admitted that they had accidentally made champagne. It was definitely not their intention, but people started really, really paying attention to this food company, this juice company, and really liking them, you know, alcoholic apple juice or not. (laughs) So they soldiered on and continued making super fun flavors of their juices. They did discontinue the fermented apple wine, but they kept making other juices and people kept buying them. Now in the 80s, as for many decades prior, Coke and Pepsi were at odds. They were doing the Coke and Pepsi challenges and the commercials fighting against each other. Soda was really, really big in the 80s. And Snapple was like, well, people should drink more juice. Maybe that's a good idea. But what happened in 1987 was huge for Snapple. Up until this point, they had just been making juice and they saw all these carbonated, caffeinated sodas that were doing so well. They were like, oh, I wonder... Maybe we could make iced tea. Now, iced tea being sold commercially and pre-made was not super innovative. It wasn't a crazy thing, but it wasn't very good. It was really watered down and people, it wasn't highly consumed. It wasn't a huge, like popular drink to purchase, except Snapple found a way to bottle their tea hot and that made it taste it, what sounds like from my research, people were like, oh, it was a, literally a million times better than all the other iced tea out there. So people loved it. So in 1987, they came out with their first iced tea, which was lemon flavored. So it was lemon Snapple iced tea. And people went wild. They were absolutely fatal. It was flying off the shelves. They were doing so, so well. They had a ton of radio advertisements with Rush Limbaugh and uh, Howard Stern being their like radio guys, uh, which is interesting. Apparently, I don't really know a lot about like the radio landscape of the late 1980s, early 90s. But I do know that Howard Stern was like very controversial and Rush Limbaugh, I think also was. So it's interesting to have both of them be like the voice of Snapple. And then in the 90s, they did something so brilliant. We are introduced to Wendy Kaufman, who is known in our lives most likely as the Snapple lady. She just had a real proclivity for reading fan letters and making it super entertaining and cute. She's this very adorable woman from, uh, I think she was a Long Island girl too, because this is all still happening in New York. Did I say that? It was in Brooklyn. Did I say that? Whoops. Sorry. This is all happening in Brooklyn. (laughs) And she was just this cute lady who worked in the marketing department and would read fan letters. She was from Long Island. And the advertising group of the company was like, hell yeah, like, let's get her to do this and do the commercials. And if you guys have ever seen these commercials, they are so flipping cute. It's adorable. It's, it's insane. I wish I could put one in here, but I'm scared of copyright. So just type in like Snapple lady nineties commercials. They're really, really sweet. And it's just cute. And it, it really endeared people to the company even more so than they already were. Now, Snapple was also apparently a super, super chill company to work for. I vividly remember when I was like 12 or 13 being like, oh, I bet Snapple would be cool to work for because they just seemed cool. Like, like Snapple has the same energy as like Burt's Bees, where I'm like, they're cool companies. And it turns out that the little 13 year old Rini was spot on because apparently Snapple was one of the first companies to be very cool about like flexible hours for maternity and paternity leave. Um, they did really solid benefits for their employees. They didn't have a ton of employees, actually, which was interesting. With the amount that they were producing, you would think that they had some crazy bottling plant with thousands of employees. But what they did was really smart. They had about 30 different packaging facilities throughout the United States. So like they would have their product made at a uh, bottling place that was doing a ton of other ones. So they didn't have their own employees doing it. So it was a lot less overhead for them. So they could provide more benefits and stuff. They only had like, I think I read like 80 people working at the company back in this like heyday time. Um, And... 
They also provided transportation for employees that had didn't have a car or had a hard time getting to the place in New York that the building had like moved to. It's called like Valley Spring. Now, in the early 2000s, uh, like a lot of companies, when they do super well, they went public. A lot of businessy stuff happens. I don't know. They like get acquired by this company and sold by this company and sued by someone and da da that part was kind of boring to me, so I'm I'm sorry if that's if that's your energy. I was like, okay, I just want are the facts real or not? <laughs> that's kind of what I was trying to do this whole podcast for. So business, business, business. Unfortunately, in the early aughts and early 2010s, we did lose all three of the original founders. They had eventually gotten to the point where they each owned like a sixth of the company, I think. Um, and the rest were purchased by, you know, the bigger parent companies that bought them. Um, but we did lose all of them, which, you know, is sad because apparently they were all really nice guys. Like it was their idea to like have good benefits and do all this nice stuff. So, you know, rest in peace, Snapple Kings. The whole reason I did this episode was to figure out was because I was sitting at the coffee shop trying to think about what to do. And for some reason I thought of Snapple or I saw a Snapple something. I heard that the facts like low key aren't real. So like, what's up with that? So I started looking up that whole conspiracy and it turns out a lot of them are not. <laughs> Some totally are. Like, d- like astronauts cannot burp in space. That is a fully correct fact. That is, I don't know why I said fact like that. That is a fully correct fact that is on a Snapple cap and is true. However, there are a lot of them that aren't true. Like, one of them is like, a human dream only lasts three seconds max. And there are a lot of like neuroscientists and sleep doctors and stuff who are like, no, it's like 15 minutes. Where are you getting that information? (laughs) The facts also started in 2002. So it was and it was just another thing that the marketing department was like, there's some space on the bottom of these caps. Like, what could we do? So they started putting the facts on them. The first fact ever was that the a goldfish's attention span is three seconds. I don't know if that one's true. It seems like there's some debate about it. I don't know how you'd really be able to tell, but there's a lot of them that aren't. Like, a like. let me read you this. A duck's quack absolutely does echo. So if you've read that one, wrong. And that's the other thing. A lot of these are very easily Googleable. Some of them have been like myth busted, like the, the duck quack one. But, but like one of them is like jellyfish are 95% water. And you, if you Google jellyfish, there's 4,000 different species, some of which are made up of less water than that, some of which are made up of more water. Some jellyfish are 99% water and some are like 80% water. So some of them are just like weird and silly. Also, one of the facts is something that we've done a podcast about. It says that honey is the only food that doesn't spoil. And while it is one of the foods that does not spoil, it is not the only one. Flour doesn't spoil, usually salt, vinegar. So a lot of hard alcohol doesn't spoil. So some of them are just like, that's that's not entirely true. <laughs> oh, and a mosquito does not have 47 teeth. It has no teeth. It has proboscis, but not teeth. So that's a weird one. So if you're wondering, okay, well, then why do they say they're real facts? Some of them absolutely are. And some of them are not. Snapple's website is quoted as saying, we call them real facts because they are just that, real facts. We check the validity of our real facts before we put them into circulation. But if you find a fact that may be inaccurate, please let us know. We will have our fact checking team look into any discrepancies. So I th- there also there are also some missing numbers on the fact. So, you know, it'll be like real fact number 436. Um, I guess there's no real. I mean, unless you is there anyone who's collected all of them and is like number 72 is missing. I wonder. But they do say that when a fact does get checked and it's incorrect, they'll retire that fact. So that's where the number goes. Um, oh, and now. I guess in the 2010s, I think that they started using plastic bottles, which are like recycled plastic, which is so cool. But they're no longer the like glass bottles with the really nice twist off caps, which I guess is if it's better for the environment. Great. But I don't I could not figure out if they have facts on them or not. So I'm going to have to check that when I go buy my little Snapple today and see if that's see if the facts are still on there. Anyway, that's the history of Snapple. (laughs) 
I uh, I know this isn't the most well-researched episode we've ever done, but really I had like a little question that I was like, we could do a whole pod about this. And I'm glad. I, I liked learning that Snapple was actually a cool company that kind of pioneered being nicer to their employees. That made me happy. And I hope it made you happy too. So thank you again to my patrons for supporting this podcast. Thank you again to my viewers and listeners for supporting this podcast as well. Um, I love y'all so much. I hope you have a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Goodbye.